Welcome to a voyage through time, aboard one of the world's most famous and glamorous liners, the Queen Mary. She was an important ship even before her launch, setting new standards in a romantic age of travel. During the war, luxurious fittings gave way to temporary bunks, and she carried nearly a million troops. In the post-war era, with her sumptuous interior restored, she reigned the North Atlantic, becoming the way to cross between America and Europe. Diners were offered cuisine, which rivaled that of the very best hotels around the world, and sumptuous interiors, which still impress today. She was the ship of the stars, boasting famous names such as Bob Hope, Fred Astaire, Evelyn Lay, and Laurel and Hardy. She remains today as a fascinating reminder of a bygone age. Join us in a look at a legend of the Atlantic. RMS Queen Mary, one of the world's largest and fastest passenger ships, was the result of years of research and careful planning by naval architects and the Cunard shipping line. The plans for a superliner with a length of over 1,000 feet were begun as early as 1926. Cunard had a contract with the British government to carry mail between Britain and the United States. Using three ships, they also carried cargo and passengers on a weekly schedule between Southampton and New York, calling at Cherbourg en route. But by the mid-twenties, the existing liners, Mauritania, seen here, the Aquitania and Berengaria were becoming old and would soon need replacing. Championed by the chairman of Cunard, Sir Percy Bates, the concept of using not three, but two larger and faster ships to maintain the same service was conceived. There were numerous revisions and some 8,000 tank experiments with scale models, but by the late 1920s, the plans for the first of the two new ships were complete. A three-funneled liner of conventional design featuring a cruiser stern. It was calculated that the minimum speed required to maintain the service with two vessels would be 28 and a half knots, but despite this, suggestions of an attempt to gain the coveted blue ribbon were strongly denied. The contract to build the world's largest liner was awarded to the John Brown Shipyard of Scotland, and work started on job number 534, as she was known, on the 1st of December 1930. The project was enormous. After the keel was laid, the rib-like structure slowly took form. Steel plates, measuring up to 30 feet in length and weighing up to three tons, were riveted into position, and the 12 decks were laid. Meanwhile, men and women toiled in preparation for the vessel's launch, producing the items necessary for the fitting out. Progress was rapid, and 534 began to take shape. Then, just months before the expected launch date, work came to an abrupt halt due to the recession of the early 1930s. The depression had taken its toll and funds for the building of the new ship had run out. Nearly 4,000 men employed directly in the construction of the new ship were redundant and up to 10,000 contractors and subcontractors suffered the same fate.
For 27 months, the half-finished hull of number 534 dominated the Clydeside skyline until eventually, initiated by local politician David Kirkwood, a solution to the economic crisis was found. The British government were to provide a loan on condition that Cunard merged with the ailing White Star Line. They agreed. Cunard may not have liked the arrangement, but they now had sufficient funds to complete their new ship. On the 3rd of April 1934, the men of Clydeside finally returned to work. Their first job was the removal of 130 tonnes of rust which had accumulated on the languishing hull, an indication of the enormity of the vessel. It was expected that the resumption of work would be a symbol of hope, yet in the event it proved a massive morale boost, not only for the people of Clydeside, but for the whole nation. Within six months, number 534 was ready for launching. The date was the 26th of September 1934, and for the first time, the consort of a reigning British monarch was to perform the ceremony. Queen Mary had agreed to launch the ship bearing her name. of 1,019 feet and 6 inches, the Queen Mary was beaten in size only by the Normandy of France, which had been launched in 1932. Once launched, the fitting out was begun. 24 water tube boilers, 4 100-ton turbines, generators, pumps, plumbing and 4,000 miles of wiring. Finally, the vast funnels were carefully manoeuvred into position. First-class passengers were used to gracious living and the Queen Mary was to cater for their every need. The best materials were used, not only from the UK, but various parts of the British Empire. They included six miles of carpet, two acres of leather and 56 different types of veneer. These rare colour photographs were taken by Madame Yvonne in 1936. For 18 months, cabinet makers and craftsmen produced furniture and installed panelling. In the veranda grill and ballroom, a unique system of lights which changed colour according to the tempo of the music was fitted. Advanced safety features were also incorporated, such as a remote control fire extinguishing system which could be operated from the special fire station. As the ship neared completion, Edward, the new king, went to the Clyde Bank Yard for a tour. More than 30 highly respected artists were commissioned to produce decorative artwork which was to feature mainly in the first class area of the ship. Much of this remains today.
24th of March 1936, the Queen Mary was complete and ready to embark upon her sea trials. First, she had to make the tentative voyage of 15 miles down the Clyde, witnessed by thousands of sightseers. This was arguably one of the most dangerous of her career. Navigating the tight bends in relatively shallow water was hazardous, and the ship ran aground twice. Although the incidents appeared on the daily casualty list at Lloyd's, there was no damage. It was a day when her builders felt the mixed emotions of a job well done, and sadness that their relationship with the extraordinary liner was at an end. After taking aboard lifeboats and extra fuel, trials using the measured Admiralty Mile off the Isle of Arran were deemed a complete success. On the 26th of July 1933, Her Majesty the Queen opened the King George V graving dock in Southampton. It was Britain's largest dry dock built in anticipation of the nation's largest liner. Southampton was about to become the Queen Mary's home port. Public interest in the ship was higher than ever, so perhaps it was not surprising that she received a magnificent welcome when she arrived in Southampton for the first time. A crowd of three quarters of a million turned out, and from that moment a bond was forged between the ship and the people of Southampton, which lasts to this day. The Queen Mary was like a floating village, totally self-contained once at sea, and consequently the list and quantities of stores were vast. They included 200,000 pieces of china, glass and earthenware, and the produce consumed on each voyage included 100,000 pounds of vegetables, 70,000 eggs and 4,000 gallons of milk. Her maiden voyage, under the command of Sir Edgar Britton, was spectacular. I don't know how many thousands of people came to see us off, but... Um there was a tremendous amount of excitement. There were several trains came down from Waterloo, boat trains came, and they came right in alongside the ocean dock and spilled their passengers out onto the, into the dock building itself. They, the passengers were very well looked after. The excitement on decks was, was tremendous. Um, every passenger had um, visitors, of course, and uh, it was quite a business, I think, getting rid of them and getting them ashore. And the only place that was quiet, perfectly calm and peaceful was down below. And then we were already used to running the engines and the generating stations, and there was no panic there at all. On arrival in New York on Monday the 1st of June, the port gave the Queen Mary a rapturous welcome, even by New York standard, and thousands of Americans gave themselves an unofficial break from work to greet her. We were met long before we got to within sight of land by three airplanes who flew round the ship and greeted us. And as we got nearer New York, um, boats started to come out. And I think everything that could float in New York City and harbour came out to meet us. The thing I remember most about it was not only the number of boats and the thousands of people crammed on them, but the noise. Because every boat had a whistle, and every whistle was tied open. And the noise, the, it was a cacophonous noise. It was absolutely indescribable. And they escorted us up the Hudson River up to... Pier 90, where tugs came out and, uh, and took us alongside. The mid-1930s saw the beginning of a golden age of travel, and the Queen Mary, making her weekly voyages to and from New York, became the way to cross the Atlantic. She was split into three classes, cabin, tourist and third, with varying degrees of grandeur. 
the classes were segregated. Integration was not permitted, except during religious services, and fraternization between crew and passengers was taboo. The opulence and impeccable Cunard service was appreciated by her first-class passengers, as were the choice of 18 breakfast cereals, the heated swimming pool and telephone in every cabin. Unashamed glamour prevailed, and it was rare if there wasn't at least one celebrity or famous politician aboard. I met many a celebrity. I mean, <laughs> I remember seeing Robert Taylor. I met him, uh, in fact, I was looking over the side of the swimming, uh, from the Turkish bath, you could see down into the swimming pool. I was looking over there and he came along and bumped into me through which way is the Turkish bath. The shock of my life to see Robert Taylor. I was only 16, 17 years of age. Sam Goldwyn came through. Louis B. Mayer, Walt Disney. Sir Alexander Calder. Uh, and Noel Coward travelled with Lady Pill, Beatrice Liddy. It was well known. She went to the captain one day and said, excuse me, captain, what time does this place arrive in New York? Most of the people came down to the Turkish bath. It was in two sections, ladies. Uh, ladies in the morning between 10 and 2, gentlemen between 7 and 10 in the morning, and 2 and 7 in the evening. Uh, but they mainly came down to listen to stories because my boss, Mr. Arthur Mason, was a well-known character on the ocean. He started way back in the Berengaria, and they should come down to exchange stories. And uh, I think they came down also to have a pint of beer. I mean, they kept away from their wives. It was two hours spent of drinking, laughing, joking, and then diving into the swimming pool afterwards. And I got involved in this, uh, mainly because I had to carry the beer. Virtually every service was available aboard the City at Sea. Banks, travel bureaus, shops, hair and beauty salons, a hospital, and even a gardener and kennels. The Queen Mary was a great success, but after a few voyages, with the onset of bad weather, shortcomings came to light. Much to Cunard's embarrassment, the new liner suffered serious vibration at the stern. This was largely overcome when work was carried out in December 1934, but another, more serious problem had emerged, the ship's ability to roll. The first gale we were in, she rolled to 14 degrees out of the vertical. It doesn't sound very much, but it's an arc of 28 degrees. And on a tall ship where the top decks are over 100 feet from the water, you're traveling quite a distance sideways through the air as she rolls. Later on, in very bad storms, she rolled to 44 degrees. And that has to be seen to be believed. You, it, it's impossible to describe. To walk across a room, the only way you can do it is along the wall with one foot on the floor and one on the wall because 44 is only one degree away from halfway between vertical and horizontal. Now, they had never imagined the Queen Mary was going to roll like this. And consequently, none of the furniture was bolted down to the deck. So the furniture was all loose. In the main lounge, for example, there was a polished maple floor, a dance floor, on top of which was a thick pile carpet. But of course the carpet at a certain degree of roll started to slide with all the furniture on it. And it would slide from one side of this room to the other side, over 70 feet. And you can imagine at 44 degrees how, uh, what happened to the furniture. The furniture wasn't sliding, it was rolling over. And nobody could get in, it was far too dangerous to get in to uh, secure it. And you just had to let it go. And in one of the tourist lounges, there was a, a piano, a Chalon upright piano. And that got loose. And for three days, that was on its own careering round this lounge. And it wrecked everything. Not only everything, but itself as well. And by the time we got to Southampton, there was nothing left of that piano but um, the iron frame and a few jangled strings. And the noise it made while it was doing this was absolutely glorious. It was like a mad harpist careering about the place. 
but the damage done was tremendous. We did a lot of damage to passengers too. On that trip when we came into Southampton, there were 27 ambulances on the quayside waiting for us. And some people were rather badly hurt and fallen downstairs and things. Despite her shortcomings, the Queen Mary was a worthy contender for the Blue Riband. The accolade awarded to the vessel able to make the fastest round trip across the Atlantic. The Normandy was the Queen Mary's greatest rival and holder of that trophy. The failure of the British ship to take the record on her maiden voyage was viewed by many with disappointment. But not so by Sir Percy Bates, who emphasised that Cunard did not indulge in racing. In spite of this, the great liner took the Blue Riband in 1938 and set a record which remained unbroken for the next 14 years. News that Britain was officially at war with Nazi Germany broke whilst the Queen Mary was on her way to America. Initially, the ship was laid up in New York as she was considered too valuable and too big a target to put at risk during the hostilities. But with her prodigious speed, she was also a great asset. By March 1940, the second Cunard superliner, the Queen Elizabeth, was complete. In secret, she too made the journey to New York. Together with the Normandy, for the first and last time, the three largest liners in the world lay together. Two weeks later, the Queen Mary, with her camouflage of wartime grey, left for Sydney, Australia. She was to be converted to a troop carrier. Lavish peacetime fittings gave way to enough bunks and showers to accommodate 5,000 soldiers. Armaments were installed, and a degaussing strip was attached to the outside of the hull as a precaution against magnetic mines. Even today, in the right light, the weld marks are still visible. The ship's first voyage as a troop carrier from Australia to Gurukh, Scotland, was gruelling. As a ship designed for the cooler weather of the North Atlantic, she was not equipped with air conditioning, except in certain public rooms. Consequently, riots broke out due to the intense heat whilst travelling in the Pacific, and deaths occurred through heat exhaustion. The converted liner then took men to Singapore, where she underwent a much-needed overhaul. As the war progressed and changed direction, the ship's routes varied, but her primary mission remained the same, to transport men with great speed to where they were most needed. As the demand for soldiers grew, the liner's capacity was enlarged. By 1942, she was capable of accommodating 8,500 personnel. Following a predetermined zigzag course to confuse the enemy, the Queen Mary, or Grey Ghost, as she was nicknamed, could outrun the German U-boats with ease. Hitler even promised a bounty equivalent to $250,000 and the Iron Cross to any U-boat captain successful in sinking her. I spent a couple of years on the Queen Mary during the war, carrying troops. And um, the Turkish bath, of course, then was just blocked off, and it was used for uh, American kitchen utensils, big billy cans and soup terrines and all that. It's a shame. I could see all the beautiful tiling being battered and shattered. And the swimming pool, they had people eating, having meals in the swimming pool, over the, they covered it in. Uh, that was quite an experience, and I know to a fact we carried over 16,000 troops at one particular time. Three meals, two meals a day they had, seven sittings a meal. In October 1942, there occurred the biggest disaster of the Queen Mary's career. The 4,200-tonne cruiser HMS Curacoa was escorting the 81,000-tonne liner on the last leg of a voyage to Scotland. As the Curacoa crossed in front of the liner, the two vessels collided. Those aboard the Queen Mary felt no more than a bump, but the cruiser was sliced in two and sank in minutes with the loss of 329 crew members. Despite severe damage to her bow, the Queen Mary was able to continue at reduced speed to Guruk, where temporary repairs were made.
The last of her war duties came after the war. Having already taken wounded American servicemen back to the United States, the Queen Mary was to carry 22,000 American and Canadian war brides. She made 13 voyages, four babies being born en route. On the 29th of September, the ship was finally demobbed. She had carried nearly a million personnel and steamed over 650,000 miles without the loss of a single life to the enemy. It was the belief of Sir Winston Churchill that the contribution made by the Queens, Mary and Elizabeth, had shortened the Second World War by at least a year. After the war, the ship underwent a complete refurbishment in Southampton. During the 10-month refit, 10,000 items of furniture were brought out of storage, wood panelling was repolished, new flooring laid, and carpets and soft furnishings replaced. The refit was also an opportunity to make some changes. The first class starboard gallery became an air-conditioned cinema. The elegant ballroom was removed and one of four private dining rooms became a bar. On the promenade deck, two new garden lounges were added and below decks, the crew's cramped quarters were improved. Artwork covered during the war once again saw the light of day and where necessary was restored. This large panel depicting entertainers needed to be totally repainted. The artist Doris Zinkeisen took the chance to update her work by adding a film star to the lineup. Some of the terminology was also changed. The three class system remained, but the name third was dropped. After the war, the classes were known as first, cabin and tourist. By 1946, the Queen Elizabeth was ready for her first commercial voyage, but another great liner, the Aquitania, was to be scrapped and her furniture sold at auction. Twenty years after the idea was conceived, the two-ship weekly service had at last begun. During her conversion to troop carrier, the Normandy had sadly caught fire and sunk. The Queens, now unopposed, would rule the North Atlantic. All, however, was not plain sailing. During 1949, in poor conditions, the Queen Mary ran aground at Cherbourg. As the tide receded, all four of her vast propellers could be seen out of the water. Amazingly, damage was limited to a few leaking rivets and dented keel plates. The unfortunate rolling action still continued, and many passengers opted to fly rather than sail during winter months. Eventually, in 1958, stabilizers were fitted. It was a long and expensive job, but it proved entirely successful. By now, though, air travel was gaining popularity, and it was only a matter of time before the great Cunardas would be running at a loss. In an effort to boost trade, both ships started cruising during winter. Unfortunately, the Queen Mary's cruising capability was severely hampered by her lack of air conditioning and inability to traverse the Suez or Panama canals. By the mid-1960s, the once profitable Queen Mary was losing up to £8,000 a day, and a decision was therefore taken. She and her sister ship, the largest and fastest, most luxurious liners in the world, were to be sold. The Queen Mary was to be the first and in 1967 Cunard invited bids from anyone interested in buying her. 17 offers were made from around the world, many from scrap dealers. The successful offer came from the City Council of Long Beach, California and she was sold for $3.45 million. 
part of the deal, although Cunard initially resisted, was to have a last great cruise. And the 39-day journey, the ship's longest peacetime voyage, was a sellout. Watched by thousands of emotional onlookers, she left her home port of Southampton for the last time, bound for Long Beach. On October the 30th, 1967, the ship departed for uh, its final voyage, which was routed to hit eight different ports uh, and being too large for the Panama Canal or the Straits of Magellan, it was of course routed around Cape Horn. So as we left Southampton, it was rainy and foggy, and, and but in spite of that, there were thousands and thousands of people around the waterfront lining the whole area of southern England. After I dropped my pilot and I rung those four engines full ahead, and could feel those 165,000 horses starting to get into a canter, then into a full gallop. I felt like a young man, young boy, if you like, with a magnificent toy to play with. And I just enjoyed being captain of that ship. Cape Horn was rounded in remarkably calm conditions and the ship duly arrived in Long Beach in bright sunshine on the 9th of December 1967. She was greeted by a flotilla of 10,000 small craft. I think everything could float in the Southern California was out to greet the ship. Uh, it was a monstrous celebration. Probably never said anything like that again. And it was, uh, it was heartwarming to at last get home. And uh, it was a the night before, Captain uh, J. Treasure Jones, who had been a charming and knowledgeable man the whole voyage, gave a talk at, in the uh, Queen Salon. Now, and I don't think there was a dry eye on the ship. Very, very emotional experience. The Queen Mary's new owners were to make the liner a museum, tourist attraction, conference center, and hotel, with an initial budget, including her purchase, of $8.75 million. Work began soon after her arrival. 20,000 tons of wood and metal, including her machinery and some bulkheads, were ripped out and sold as scrap. The cavernous spaces this created were to become Jacques Cousteau's Museum of the Sea. For various reasons, the project suffered delays and the budget soared to over $100 million. The Museum of the Sea although smaller than intended, opened, but was not a commercial success. But somehow, sometimes against the odds, the Queen Mary has survived. are those who consider the ship's new role in Long Beach a sad end to her 31-year ocean-going career. Her sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, was destroyed by fire in Hong Kong in 1972. With the loss of the Lizzie, the Queen Mary is now the very last liner from a golden age of travel, the last reminder of an era never to return, and the largest passenger ship in the world. People have a special feeling still about this ship, and they're very emotional when they come back and see her again. They may have had a connection where they have never boarded the ship before in Southampton, but they 
grew up uh, hearing her whistle as she was leaving uh, every week or would watch her come up the river into berth. Um, crew members, of course, have revisited the ship and given their, mem their memories about this place being their home and what a happy ship she was during her 31 years at sea. Uh, you had the GIs who were going off to war, coming back to war, uh, and the fears whether they were going to make it across the Atlantic and what was going to happen to them, of course, when they got to the other side. And then you have the war brides that were coming to the United States for the first time. Um, there's so many memories and so many emotions. We've had, to this date, about 250 different projects from the Poseidon Adventure to Charlie's Angels to Murder, She Wrote, and all kinds of commercials and other projects uh, shot here. Anytime Hollywood needs either a 1930s background, uh, whether it be on board a ship or not, or of course any shipboard location, this is where they come. And so uh, we're being used constantly for things like that. One of the myths about the Queen Mary that, that many people still have today is that she's embedded in concrete or sitting on pilings or something like that. But uh, if you come here and simply take a look at the gangways, you can see that she is indeed floating with the tide. And that enables us to uh, keep the ship better preserved and do some interesting things such as attach a box around the last remaining propeller on board the ship and give people views that they would not have had uh, had they been passengers or crew members on board during her sailing career. So you can actually go out and take a look at one of the propellers outside of the ship. When all of the machinery was removed from down below, you had these huge uh, hatches where the funnels used to be from the boiler rooms and hatches above the engine rooms. And of course, with those huge spaces, they were able to uh, deck them over at each level and, and use a huge amount of that space. In fact, they used to have an office in one of the funnel hatches. And also one of our salons, the Windsor Salon, actually was uh, the number two funnel hatch. But we've decked that over once the ship came to Long Beach, and we used that as a, a room leading into the Grand Salon, or the first class dining room. Basically exploded some of the original walls, brought them out, so you have all the original uh, the feel and, uh, of the wood and the atmosphere but yet uh, you'd never know that you were dancing directly above one of the boiler rooms. It's unlikely that the Queen Mary will ever go to sea again, certainly not under her own steam, but she remains as a floating museum, a reminder of a bygone age. Although many alterations have been made since 1967, large areas of the ship remain unspoilt. They are open to the public and reveal the opulence and grandeur once available to those who could afford them. The first class restaurant, seen here during the popular Sunday brunch, is much the same as it was when the ship was ocean going. The fine wood panelling is original and with a height of 27 feet, the restaurant is still one of the largest rooms afloat. The decorative map of the North Atlantic by MacDonald Gill features a crystal model of the Queen Mary, which was moved each day to indicate the position of the real ship. After the war, the Queen Elizabeth was added. Two paintings of birds were produced for the restaurant by Duncan Cass, whilst Bainbridge Copnall's pinewood carvings with their maritime theme were commissioned to add further decoration. The first class lounge is another of the Queen Mary's significantly large rooms, extending to 96 feet in length. Like other first class facilities, it occupies a location amidships, the most stable and comfortable part of a liner. By day, the room remained a luxury lounge. At night, with the furniture removed, it became a ballroom. The orchestra would play until the very last couple left the floor, even if that meant playing until seven in the morning. The bronze reliefs are the work of Maurice Lambert. To achieve a consistency of color, each fireplace and the eight lighting urns were carved from a single block of onyx. 
Unicorns in Battle, the Gesso Panel by Gilbert Bays and Alfred Oakley features flaps which were used for projection equipment. Mirrors were given a peach tint. That way, any passengers who felt a little off colour as the ship rolled received a psychological boost if they caught a glimpse of themselves. The first class smoking room remains virtually unchanged since 1936 and still retains the character of an English country home. This was the only place aboard to feature a genuine log burning fire, although even this ceased to be used after the war. The pictures are by Edward Wadsworth. At the forward end of the promenade deck, the first class observation lounge became one of the most popular public rooms aboard the liner. It has been extended to include an outer walkway, but the decor is largely original. It's easy to imagine the stars of yesteryear relaxing amid the maple panelling beneath R.A. Thompson's spectacular painting which depicts the celebration of George V's Silver Jubilee. The veranda grill, which boasted theatrical decor and an intimate nightclub atmosphere, is long gone. Once the most famous room afloat, and a favourite haunt of the Duke of Windsor, it became a burger bar in the early 1970s. The second class swimming pool was also removed, but the first class pool remains, and with its handcrafted tiles and indirect lighting, it's a reminder of the elegant era of Art Deco. When the liner ran into rough weather, the entire contents of the pool could be drained in just 25 minutes. It can no longer be used, but forms part of a guided tour of the ship. First class travellers would have been offered the choice of one of 22 private suites located on main or A decks. They included at least one bedroom, a sitting room and private bathroom, and often quarters for a servant. Piccadilly Circus, or Prom Deck Square as it was originally called, was the first class shopping centre. The illuminated cabinets were used to display jewellery and other luxury items, as well as souvenirs and sundries. The original wood panelling was covered with leather during the post-war refit. Even here, decoration was important. Maurice Lambert was commissioned to produce a frieze with a theme of sport and speed. It was not only first-class passengers, however, who enjoyed luxurious surroundings. Although less opulent and decorous, second class was of a very high standard. The main lounge was the social centre for the second class traveller. The etched niche mirror is the work of Margot Gilbert, as are the panels of painted leather with their theme of dance. In 1992, the Disney Corporation, which had been operating the ship, decided not to renew its lease. Consequently, the Queen Mary's future came into question. Several options were considered, including scrapping, selling and even sinking her in deep water. Eventually, bids were invited for her purchase and as in 1967, they arrived from around the world. But at the last moment, despite some very negative press reports concerning the state of her hull, the City Council decided to retain the ship. The reports, however, raised important questions concerning the liner's condition below the waterline. Former professional diver Hull Johnson was for many years responsible for monitoring the condition of the ship's hull. The hull is sound. Uh, any uh, corrosion that I ever found was uh, was relatively insignificant. There. Um, uh, 
you have to consider that at the outset the, the ship was built of a uh, the highest grade of steel that was not only available in 1931 but uh, you know available today uh, the uh, uh, she's a high grade of manganese uh, steel plate and she's an inch and a quarter thick and in all critical areas below the water line she's double plated that's to say that in uh, in any area that's uh, that needs a structural soundness more than the rest of the hull she's two and a half inches thick and that's considerable I mean that's almost uh, the way an icebreaker is built you know and uh, so her construction as opposed to the construction of ships today it's the old adage they just don't build them like that anymore to help decide the fate of the liner, Long Beach City Council commissioned International Diving Services to independently survey the hull. Specifically, the city was concerned about the shell plating, the rivets, the shell plating thickness, corrosion, things of that nature. So what we did was we customized an inspection where we performed or, uh, or, or cleaned and, and inspected only certain parts of the ship. In this case, I believe we, we looked at uh, 20 individual uh, spots in the ship. We looked at uh, uh, shell plating, uh, rivets, uh, points where they had uh, sea chests that had been blanked off. A sea chest is an area where they have uh, uh, pipes go through that take water into the ship for the ship's uh, equipment. And uh, because the ship is on display, it had been blanked off, and there was concerns that those might leak uh, so we looked at uh, certain spots uh, as was required to, to bring back the information that they needed. We, we found the, uh, the hull to be in uh, extraordinarily good shape for the, for the age of the vessel. Frequently a ship that sits for long periods of time and isn't properly protected will corrode severely. And this ship uh, had been well maintained and had a good cathodic protection system on it. Uh, there was good uh, uh, plate thickness. Uh, uh, the uh, rivets, we x-rayed some of them, uh, apparently the first time that, that that had been done, and uh, we saw no deterioration uh, on the interior. That was the concern that the interior of the rivets had corroded, and uh, they appeared to be in very good condition. Uh, we ultrasounded, where we used an ultrasonic uh, gauge and measured the thickness of the plate at various locations and found that, that to be in, a, in extremely good shape. There were some areas of, of corrosion, but they were isolated. And uh, uh, overall, it was in just a, a, a excellent condition. So there's no danger of a sinking there? No. No. Yeah, we try to put away Entrepreneur life. Joe Prevotil has been closely involved in the operation of the Queen Mary for a number of years. Well, the ship actually has a million square feet on it, which most people don't appreciate how large the ship is. And, uh, Right now, uh, what's available to the public in one form or another, be it three decks of, of cabins and hotel sleeping rooms, be it our banquet rooms, be it our exhibit halls, the, the attraction tour, etc., cetera, we, we, we have about a half of that, about a half a million. And so we still have another half a million in the holds of the ship, which we are holding off for future uh, development. Christopher Davis, president of the Long Beach Convention and Visitors Council, has no doubts that the ship is still very much a part of the city. Essentially, the Queen Mary, whenever we go anywhere in the world and, and run into anybody and mention we're from Long Beach, it's the very first thing that people know. Uh, it has become so associated with, with Long Beach that it is sort of like the Eiffel Tower is to Paris or the Golden Gate Bridge is to San Francisco. It's something that we're known for. It's not only what we're known for, and it's not what only draws uh, people into the community, but obviously it creates jobs and employment for people here. The Queen Mary has always been an important ship. She raised the morale of a nation, worked tirelessly through the war, and made 1,001 transatlantic crossings. She survives as a unique link with the past and the world's favorite liner. She is a legend of the Atlantic.